Beloved Lord, this morning we turn to the letter of 2 John. Uh, 2 John. Two weeks ago we covered 3 John. This morning we'll cover 2 John. It's found right towards the end of the Bible. Um, Revelation being the final book of the Bible. Jude right before that. And then the three epistles or letters of John. And our focus is on 2 John this morning. I should turn there just one note. I forgot to mention an announcement uh, that the Sunday school classes will begin January 12th. Not January 5th, so January 12th will be the start, start of Sunday school. Uh, so two weeks to go yet before that begins. Our scripture reading once more, Second John, right near the end of the Bible. We'll read through the whole uh, letter, and we'll focus upon the whole letter as well. Second John, beginning in verse 1, the elder. To the elect lady and her children, whom I love in truth, and not only I, but also all those who have known the truth, because of the truth which abides in us and will be with us forever. Grace, mercy, and peace will be with you from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth and love. I rejoice greatly that I have found some of your children walking in truth as we received commandment from the Father. And now I plead with you, lady, not as though I wrote a new commandment to you, but that which we have had from the beginning, that we love one another. This is love, that we walk according to his commandments. This is the commandment that as you have heard from the beginning, you should walk in it. For many deceivers have gone out into the world who do not confess Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. Look to yourselves that we do not lose those things we worked for, but that we may receive a full reward. Whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. He who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine, do not receive him into your house nor greet him. For he who greets him shares in his evil deeds. Having many things to write to you, I did not wish to do so with paper and ink, but I hope to come to you and speak face to face, that our joy may be full. The children of your elect sister greet you. Amen. That's our scripture reading and our focus on Second John as well this morning. And again, we'll do our best to cover uh, the entire uh, letter as uh, John writes to the elect lady. Well, beloved in the Lord, this is one of uh, very unique letters in the Bible. As far as we can tell, it is a personal letter uh, from John uh, to a woman he loves in truth, uh, who has a family she is seeking to raise for the kingdom of God. There have been different theories that perhaps John's referring to a church as the elect lady, her children perhaps being the members of the church. It's possible, but if so, it would be a rare exception uh, not found elsewhere in Scripture of how John is addressing this. It seems far more probable that it may indeed be a, a personal letter uh, from the Apostle uh, to this woman. Now, as we read it, it's, it's a really remarkable letter. And it's a really remarkable letter because of how much it, it, it fits still with our culture and situation today. Because the letter is a letter, essentially, of warfare. It, it's a letter that speaks of an attack. And the reason John is writing her is because there has been deceivers or false Christians, anti-Christs, who have begun to erode and, and encounter the truth of the gospel. And John is writing her to try to strengthen her in the truth. If you go through this letter and you begin to underline common words, you'll see words like truth, doctrine, love, and deception coming up over and over again. John is speaking of a time when the truth is under attack and it must be stood for. And if we consider that in light of our current culture, the letter is extremely fitting. We live in a culture that is attacking the word of God like never before. The idea that you can believe the Bible as a source of truth, that the Bible has any bearing or relevance for our society, is of course long thrown out. If we are young people in this culture, if we are growing up in this culture, um, your parents will tell you it was better when they were young. <clears throat> and, and that's been said for probably a thousand years. When our parents were younger, the same attack was going on. The same battle was going on, but certainly it does seem heightened yet today. If you look at your own history, if you look at your own past, whether it's in the church or outside the church, I want you to consider in the church, if you've seen times, and the Bible has come under attack, when people have begun to say, well, the goal is, is love. The goal is love, and therefore, 
we need to make sure we read the Bible in a loving way, and, and, and maybe that means that we, ah, and you can take this in whatever way you like. There's a thousand illustrations. I'm going to pick on some easy ones, and I'm sorry to pick on the easy ones. But things like, let's say, the women in office debate, where the Bible teaches that a woman should not serve in the office of elder and deacon, and people will say, well, if we love women, if we don't want to exclude them, then we need to include them in this and, and make sure they're able to serve in these positions in the church. And that's an easy one to hit, and, and maybe we can sit in our smugness and say, boy, look at all those people sinning, but it comes out in different ways too. Ideas where love or the emphasis would cause someone to teach in a way that would undermine the gospel. Young men and women who who may be dating and, and they say they love each other. And even though the Bible says to, to wait for marriage because they love each other and they're really committed, it doesn't matter as much. And they begin to undermine truth. They begin to attack truth because of some kind of concept that they falsely set up against it of an idea of some understanding of love. In, in this letter, John is writing to a church because they're coming under attack, and, and the truth of God is under fire. Now, when the truth of God comes under fire, what happens? If we look back in our church history, when the truth of God comes under fire, what happens? You get people who begin to be great defenders of the truth, don't you? You get people who might stand up against lies, stand up against falsehood, and fight what they may call the good fight of the faith for truth. But what happens when you do that? Have you ever noticed that sometimes in seasons of warfare over truth, the idea of love is lost? It's this crazy balance, isn't it? Because sometimes love is used on the one side as a tool to make us forget God's word or compromise God's word because we want to be loving and God's word somehow isn't loving. But on the other hand, sometimes we can become so holding on to the truth and so justified in our opinions because we stand for what is right that we cease to be loving in how we do it. That we cease to show love and express Christian character in the way we stand or fight the Christian fight. And what you see in this letter that John writes to his dear friend, his dear chosen lady, is this remarkably beautiful balance that summons us to love without letting go of truth, that rejoices in the teaching of Christ, and yet anchors us in a warmth and a joy that just fits what it means to be Christian, doesn't it? And we have a lot to learn here, and that's what we come to the Bible to do, to learn. And that's what we want to focus on this morning. As we're going to study this passage, we're going to see how John calls us to live a life uh, walking in love and truth. To live walking in love and truth. These two things combined. And we'll see how it comes through in this uh, little letter, this brief letter, in three things. First, as he gives the greeting. Second, as he gives the charge. And third, as he explains the exercise of hospitality. Uh, the greeting, the charge, and the exercise of hospitality. Now again, in this, I want us to have in mind and be aware of how in times of conflict in the church that John is here describing, the idea that the uh, Bible's being attacked, there are deceivers in the world, the Antichrist is present, and again, an Antichrist is anyone who opposes Jesus. Antichrist. So when John speaks of this, when we study eschatology or the end times, the Bible teaches that there will be the Antichrist, some great movement, opposition, individual perhaps, that will come against Jesus. But all through history, there are antichrists, little ones, small a antichrists, that will stand against Jesus. And that's what John is speaking of here. People who are going against Christ, attacking the word. And I want us to keep in mind that when this happens, we can get defensive, we can get suspicious, and we can lose love. Our church federation is not very old. 
We belong as a local church, if you're with us today, to churches called the United Reformed Churches of North America. And that denomination began in around 1995. That's when it was started. It's not very old. But it came out of another denomination that was older. And that other denomination, we felt, was beginning to lose their hold upon the scriptures and not stand for the authority of God's word as they should anymore. And it came to a point where we felt we had to begin a new church that would hold on to the truth in a stronger way. But one of the outflows of that is that in the fight for truth, we perhaps gained a little suspicion and a little caution and a little loss of love in how we treated people. And I want you to see from John's letter that that never is to be done. How he writes knowing the enemy, knowing the attack upon the Bible, and yet never loses love. Look at how the the chapter begins. The elder to the elect lady and her children whom I love in truth, and not only I, but also all those who have known the truth, because of the truth which abides in us and will be with us forever. We're going to hit the first four verses in our first point, but just two for now. Notice how John begins. Two weeks ago, we studied 3 John. And if you turn the page or just look further down it, you'll see the beginning to the beloved Gaius, who I love in truth. I pray that you may prosper at all times. Do you remember what we talked about in that 3 John, if you were here, sermon? We talked about the importance of Christian love and the importance of expressing Christian love. Remember? Amen? The importance not just of loving people, but letting them know. Letting them know that you love them, that you rejoice in their faith, that you stand together in Christ. And John is the oldest of the disciples at this time. We believe he calls himself the elder, not only because of his position in the church, but also because of his age. He was the one apostle who was not martyred for his faith. He lived a long life, though he suffered for the cause of the gospel. And this man is known in his own gospel, the gospel according to John, as the beloved. He knew he was loved by Jesus. And when he writes to the church, he lets them know he loves them. He he greets them with love. My chosen lady, not my chosen lady, the chosen lady, the one who is chosen by God, whom I love in truth, and I'm not the only one who loves you, but everyone who stands in the gospel loves you. And we love you, why? Verse two, because we have something in common. We have Christ in us. That's what he's saying here. I had a neat experience when we were down in Florida, and we're thinking of Florida more, if, if you wonder. It was around this time we went on sabbatical last year, and we spent four months in Florida, And so it's been a little bit more on the mind of late. Forgive my sin. But I think you can at least sympathize with me. When we were down in Florida, we went to a Walmart often. And one time we were going to Walmart, there was a little table set up by the door, and there was two guys behind it, and they were selling crafts, Christian crafts. And uh, when I saw the crosses and, you know, some plaques with Bible verses on it, I went over and I, and I talked to them. And, and it was a rehab center, a Christian rehab center for addicts. And the men made various things that they sold at different places to make money to help pay for their rehab as they tried to get off drugs or alcohol or whatever it might be. And I got chatting with these two guys and the kids were with me. And within like 30 seconds, I knew they loved Jesus. Within 30 seconds. You can see God's work. They, they, outside of Walmart, and we just got chatting for, you know, kids are pulling at you. They were actually were really good. They, they, they went away, and the kids were excited about what they'd heard from these guys. But I met them and talked to them for maybe five, ten minutes. And there was a bond there. Why? Because they had the truth of Christ in their hearts. And by God's grace, so did I. And there is a unity in that truth. There's a unity in that gospel. There's a unity in that stand for the Lord. And that's what John's expressing from the very beginning of his letter. He's writing to a fellow Christian and just saying, my chosen lady, the chosen lady, I love you. The church loves you. And we love you because we stand together in the gospel. He's writing in a time when the antichrists are at the door. The gospel is under fire. But he begins in love. And he begins in a love that is very specific in light of the culture and grounded in truth that we hold together to Christ. 
And therefore there's a communion and a fellowship and an ethos in the church of great love for one another. And it's expressed. It's stated. I don't know if you have times where you hear a sermon and you go out and, and for the next hour or for the next day you may apply what you've heard. And a week later you can't remember what was preached. I have it all the time. Forgive my sin. It's not to make it acceptable. But two weeks ago we spoke on this with Third John expressing Christian love. Have you done it? Have you grown in expressing Christian love? Because that's the call God gives us, beloved. It's the call God gives us. Verse 3. Uh, this the whole greeting is going to point us to love and truth. Grace, mercy, and peace be with you from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth and love. Um, now, this greeting is a common greeting. We have it in the beginning of our services. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace, an undeserved gift. Mercy, uh, compassion for the hurting. And, and uh, peace, uh, that... that end of warfare, that end of striving, that end of anxiety, that end of worry, comfort, peace, rest. And these are given as God greets his people uh, all the time. They're given in God and in Christ to the church. But what John adds that's unique is that these three things, grace, mercy, and peace, come to us from God the Father and from Jesus in truth and love. Again, notice the, the combination here, that it's as we know the Lord as, as he gives us these things. It comes to us through the truth of the gospel and through the love God has for us. The only way to know God's grace is to know the gospel and to know it's for you. The only way to know God's mercy is to know that Christ died on the cross for you. There is a substance to the gospel, but there's a personal nature to the gospel. It's a recognition that God loves us. And just as an aside, if we lose focus that God's love is personal, that he loves us as individuals. If we lose that, we lose grace, we lose mercy, we lose peace. Now, even as love must be communicated in the church between members, the love of God must always be present in the church. If we lose sight of that, we have removed the foundation for a church that grows and functions in the mercy and grace of God. We lose assurance. We lose joy. Because the way God's grace comes to us is in his love and in his truth. Uh, maybe I should have done this in multiple sermons. Um, but let's hold on to that. Don't be afraid to tell people God loves them. Don't be afraid to believe that God loves you as an individual. God does not merely put up with you. In Christ, the truth, he delights in you. He rejoices over you. And all God's grace and all God's mercy that we need so desperately as Christians, it comes when we know the truth of the gospel, our fallen condition, God's grace in Christ. He had to die for us. He had to be risen from the dead for us. He lives at the right hand of the Father for us. All that truth is combined with the knowledge of God's love. Beloved, you still have that. Do you still live that way? Do you believe personally in God's love for you? And do you share that with others? Do you teach it to your kids when you raise them in the fear and admonition of the Lord? To tell them how much God loves them? To show them the fruit of it on the cross? Apart from this, there is no grace. There's no mercy. There's no peace. And then finally in the greeting... He, he, he expresses joy. And again, this idea of an expressive relationship that, that shows love, that rejoices openly in people's growth in the faith. Verse four, I rejoice greatly that I have found some of your children walking in truth as we receive commandment from the Father. Uh, John is just speaking now of this idea of truth and he, and he puts in a, a concept that's very important here, that they're walking in the truth. Uh, the truth of God's word 
is absolutely foundational. We're going to get more into that as we go. It, it, we must know the Bible. It is not enough just to know the basics. It is good to know the basics. We start with the basics. Christ died for me. He loves me. He rose again. He saved me. Praise God. Never lose it. But we want to grow in the truth. We want to learn more. We want to study the Bible. We want to have Sunday school classes. We want to have Bible studies. We want to deepen our roots in the things of God's word. But as we do so, remember this. It is never just to learn intellectually what the Bible teaches. It is because the Bible is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, dividing to the joint between bone and spirit. God changes us through his word. John prayed, and Daniel, Pastor Daniel is going to touch on John 17, the high priestly prayer of Jesus this afternoon. John 17, 1 to 5. And in that same prayer, Jesus prays in verse 17, Father, sanctify them, sanctify my disciples by your truth. Your word is truth. And that verse is a very famous verse. And the idea of what it, it means is that the Bible is always intended as a, a tool in God's hand to make you holy. Not to make you smart. Not to make you intellectually superior. To make you holy. And therefore, when John writes to the church, he rejoices in their growth in Christ, not simply because they know the truth, but because they walk in it. That's, that's what he's rejoicing in. That, that your children, at least some of your children, and we could stop and pause there, and we could give a word to parents who are chosen parents, and who are beloved of God, who have some of their children walking with the Lord and some who aren't. And we could say, wow, it happened for her too. And let's just, just take a moment on that. This lady is chosen by God, loved by God, loved by John, loved by the church. One of those people you meet and you say, wow, you're a wonderful Christian. I, I, man, I'm excited about what God's doing in your life. And yet, when John writes her, he says, you know what, I find great joy that some of your kids are walking in the truth. There is no guarantee that if we love God, our children will be saved. And the salvation of our children is not based upon how much we love God or how holy we were in our lives. Salvation is always a gift of God's undeserved grace. And he will give it as he wills. And yet when John writes here, he says, listen, I, I rejoice that some of your kids are walking in the faith. I, I praise God that they are. There's this genuine grip upon them and they are growing in the truth and the word of God is changing them. To walk in the truth means as you study the Bible of God, it changes you, it affects you. you know, as we study the Bible, we should be growing in the fruit of the Spirit, shouldn't we? Becoming more loving people, more joyful people, more peaceful people, self-controlled people. Because the, the Lord is doing that work in us through his word. He's sanctifying us by his truth. Now, where are we going with this? Just the opening session, the, the whole point, the whole idea of this letter is to strengthen this woman and her home in a time of opposition. But to begin, John just anchors them in the beauty of what God has done and doesn't want them to lose the glory of the cross, the beauty of fellowship, the beauty of communion in the church, nearness to God, the joy of expressing love, expressing thanksgiving for growth in Christ. We don't want to lose that spirit-centered, Christ-centered culture in the church as we stand for truth. Because if we do so, we've lost the gospel we're standing for. We've lost the gospel we're standing for. We'll do our best to keep pressing on with the time we have. Um, secondly, the plea, the, the, the charge. Now, 
in light of the opposition, you would think the most important thing that John had to command this woman would be to stand firm in the truth. But he gives the preeminence of the command to love. Verse 5, Now I plead with you, lady, not as though I wrote a new commandment to you, but that which we have had from the beginning, that we love one another. So the beginning, the, the first four verses is just like the opening exchange. Verse 5 is where he begins to get into his commands. And it's, it's an urgent one. It's an, I plead. I, I plead with you. I beg you. I beg you, my chosen woman who loves the Lord, I beg you that you continue in what you had from the beginning, that you love one another. And again, what comes under attack when we stand for the gospel can be the loss of love. And John is addressing that here. But notice how he does so. It's not love in an arbitrary way. It's not love in an undefined way. It's not love in a warm, fuzzy, feeling way. But he goes on to say in verse 6, this is love that we walk according to his commandments. And this is the commandment that as you've heard from the beginning, you should walk in it. He, 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 his command, his emphasis, his call is for this woman to persevere in love, but he gives that love a foundation that is rooted in the scripture that is based in God's commands. Never let someone make a contradiction between the idea of love and the command of God. Now, that's what the Antichrist does. That's what the deceiver does. That's what our culture does. They, they tell the church we are unloving when we are intolerant. That if we truly love people, we'd accept them as they are. We have ideas of parenting where concepts come out that if you really love your kids, you don't discipline them. You don't address them. We have people sometimes make comments. So I just love my kids too much to really come down hard on them. And we don't want to come down unnecessarily hard on our children. But we don't want to define love in an unbiblical way either. And to know love, we must know the word of God. We must know the commands of Christ. I don't know about you, but when I address young Christian women, whether it's my daughter or whether it's at a conference, I talk to them about what it means to be loved by a man. And I warn them that sometimes men can come to you and say to you, I love you so much. I'll be faithful to you forever. I'll be true to you forever. But I can't wait. I can't wait for marriage. I just love you so much. And I'll warn them and say this. Listen, this is biblical love. Ephesians 5. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her that he might sanctify and cleanse her by the washing of water through the word that he might present her to himself a spotless church without blemish. What is Christian love? It is when you give yourself up to make the other person holy. Holy. And I want Christian women to know and I want Christian men to know that you cannot separate love from the truth of God's word. You cannot say you have love and then violate the commands of God and still be loving. It doesn't work. Because love has definition. The definition is ultimately found in Christ, but it's found all through his word and all through his commands. And so as John tries to prepare this beloved woman for the fight before him, he calls her to love, but he grounds her right away in the truth of God's word. You can't separate them. You can't divide them. They always go hand in hand. That's why we, we dig into the scriptures. That's why we, we want to learn more about who God is. That's why we want to study the Bible. That's why I want to go back to what the Word says to know how a church is run, how a family is run, how relationships function. How are we to be a loving witness as a church in a world that has a different moral standing than we do? How do we show love? Beloved, we always go back to the Word of God. We have an ethos, we have a focus, we have a, a Christ-centered heart, but we never compromise the scriptures. We never let go of truth. And we never let go of the spirit in which God would have us hold the scriptures. A spirit which is defined by Christ. This is the call that John gives to this woman as he pleads with her to love one another, but to know love as it's found in God's word. 
a few things that we can just take for application from this as before we move on and before we go on to the next section of the scripture. This, this means that when we do things in the church, we not only do things for God's glory, but we do them God's way. It's never right to take an underhanded approach to try to bear fruit for God's glory. We don't use lies or deception or gossip to try to help the church. We make sure that we deal with each other. We honor one another. We speak truth and love to each other. We seek to serve those who are around us. Because love is defined. It has a content. That content is in Christ. That content is in the word of God. Christ who kept the commands of the Lord perfectly. And I combine these two things. The reason for it, as you've mentioned repeatedly, is that there are those who oppose the gospel, and attack the gospel, attack the, the uh, church. We have to finish up. Um, and so we're just going to jump to the third point, unfortunately. And it's just the, the idea of hospitality. And, and this is just kind of remarkable, especially in light of what we've studied late, lately. In the last little while, we've studied Matthew 25. I don't even remember the passage, but we studied verses 31 to 46, where Jesus speaks about the end judgment and, and says... Come, you blessed of my Father, receive the inheritance prepared for you from before the foundation of the world, because I was hungry and you fed me, I was thirsty and you gave me drink, I was a stranger and you welcomed me. Remember that passage? We talked about the importance of welcoming strangers. Now listen to these words in verse 10 and 11. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine, do not receive him into your house nor greet him, for he who greets him shares in his evil deeds. This combination of love and truth impacts the way we run our homes. The idea of what John is saying here is is if you have someone coming into your neighborhood and they're bringing a false gospel, don't even let them in the door of your home. Don't support them. Don't show allegiance to them in the way they act. Don't receive them. Now he says this even though he knows the call of Christ. That by entertaining strangers, some have entertained angels without knowing it. And in doing so, again, we see this beautiful combination of love and truth in the way we run our homes, in the way we show hospitality. Because the truth of God shapes our love, doesn't it? And we we don't just love someone because we want to be kind people. We don't just show hospitality because we want to be known as, as being generous. Our hospitality and the way we welcome someone is shaped by the gospel. And this doesn't mean we can never welcome a non-Christian. This doesn't mean we can never have someone in our home who, who doesn't love Jesus. It does mean if someone is fighting the gospel, if they are being vehemently opposed to the gospel, if they are trying to destroy the church of Christ, they don't find a welcome with us. That applies as much to our homes, of course, as it does to our church. This idea of love and truth impacts uh, our, our homes. And then verse 12, John goes on to say, I'm going to come though. I'm going to be there. I'm going to see you face to face. We're going to have great joy. Uh, that's going to be hospitality you're going to enjoy. That's going to be hospitality you can have. Because the gospel and the truth of God and the love of God will shape even the way we run our homes. As we study this book, unfortunately we have to cut it a little bit short. But we want to see the overall picture of what John paints and the importance of it. The climate in the time of John and the climate today is incredibly, incredibly close. The idea of the opposition, the idea of the fight over truth, the idea of undermining the gospel, and the danger in fighting for truth that we let go of love is equally real. The way John handles it is inspired by God. A passage that puts together a firm hold on the gospel with a loving spirit that affects day-to-day fellowship in the church that affects the way we encourage others, affects the way we run our homes. And as we live as God's people in this world, these things must shape us as well. We must be people who focus upon love. The command of the passage is that we love one another. And that in that love, we are grounded in what God defines love as according to the scriptures. 
1 John 4, this is how we know love. Not that we love God, but that God loved us and gave his son as a sacrifice for our sins. Our love is shaped by the Lord in truth. And we strive by God's grace to hold them both together as good warriors of the kingdom, as good followers of Jesus, as those who love our Lord. Let's come before him together in prayer.